Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will be joined, uh, today Donna will be talking about enterprise architecture versus data architecture. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just note the Zoom default is just to the panelists, but you may switch that to chat with everyone in the webinar. And to access the Q&A or the chat panel, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, you will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce our speaker for the series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations in enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategies Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Always a pleasure to join you guys. Um, and as, as Shannon mentioned, uh, this is a monthly data architecture series. So if this is the first time you have joined us, welcome. Um, if, if any of the previous webinars are of interest to you and you missed them, they are all on demand. And one of the questions that we always get asked is, will this be on demand and will we get the slides? And, and yes to both. Uh, that's one of the benefits of Dataversity. Everything I think since the beginning of Dataversity is still online and accessible, which is a really nice resource. Um, but today, what we'll be covering is enterprise architecture, um, and, and it's specifically enterprise architecture in its relationship to um, data architecture. So this is a data architecture series, and we'll definitely have a bit of a bias um, on data architecture. But the beauty of enterprise architecture is that it really takes a more holistic view of the organization as how data relates to process, business process, uh, business capabilities, and most importantly, business value. So if, if you've been on my webinars before, you'll know that sort of my, my passion is really how you use data, but most importantly, use data to drive business value. And this is a really a good time in the industry, if that's of interest to you. I mean, most organizations are trying to be data-driven. Um, and enterprise architecture is a really great way to support that. I think for whatever reason, often architecture and particularly enterprise architecture can be seen as well something academic or um, you know, not, not very practical, but I, I would say very much on the contrary. When you're really trying to drive business value, it's almost impossible to do it without some of these enterprise architecture artifacts. So if, the, if enterprise architecture is, is new to you, this may be a helpful um, webinar. If, if you are an enterprise architecture expert, you may think some of the things I'm, I'm looking doing are rather light, and it is. I, one of my other passions is how do you do just enough architecture to show that business value? Because you know you could make months doing data models and process models and all of that, but how do how do we get that time to value and, and really focus on that kind of so what or, or the business value? Um, so because um, we are uh, data architects, we love our definitions. <laughs> so I always like to start with a definition of what are we even talking about? I, I'm a bit of a fan of the art uh, Gartner glossary. They tend to have a good definition of a lot of the RT terms. Um, and what I liked about their definition of enterprise architecture is that it, it talks about not only kind of that foundational aspect of you know the building blocks and what you need to define uh, an architecture, but it also talks about really how it is a response to the changing uh, disruptive forces in a business and how it really aligns to business vision and outcomes. And, and that's how I like to use enterprise architecture and that's how I see enterprise architecture. So I would, I would agree with them. It's, y yes, it's a, it's a foundational aspect of anything you're doing, but the real so what, or the reason you're doing it really is, should be aligned with that business vision and business outcomes. Um, if you are new to um, data, uh, enterprise architecture and you may be a data architect, we, get, we often get a lot of data architects on this call. Um, I think enterprise architecture is, is really an easy, <laughs> well, if nothing's easy, right? There's a lot of skill involved, right? Well, but it should make a lot of sense to you because um, if you're used to modeling data, you're just taking those modeling skills and applying them to other 
things. Um, can we mo model people in a way? Can we model motivation? Can we model business goals? Can we model business capabilities, business processes, um, as well as you know all of the other areas of application uh, of the organization, applications, data, network, etc. You may not need all of the types of uh, models in an enterprise architecture um, ecosystem, um, but you may pick and choose the ones that may really help tell your story when, when you're trying to relate that to business and business value. Um, there are also, like anything in, in our industry, there's always several flavors, several different definitions, competing ways of doing things. Um, some of the more popular frameworks for enterprise architecture, uh, the Zachman framework, um, if any of you may know John, John Zachman, he comes to some of the data diversities and, and enterprise data world conferences. Um, and in he, his way of looking at it um, is kind of simplifying things into that classic who, what, where, when, how. And I would say that the data is, is generally that what column. Um, and, and there's different levels to that. There's the business level, the executive what, down to the very you know implementation level of what and everything in between. I think a lot of us on the call are familiar with that, um, but when we're looking at more enterprise architecture, you're going more horizontally across the, the how, and maybe the business processes that support that data, for example, the who in terms of you know, capabilities and business um, responsibilities and things. So um, we'll kind of use some of these aspects um, in this presentation, another very popular and very robust um, way of looking at enterprise architecture is kind of that TOGA approach. Um, again, each, each one of these could have a whole webinar in themselves. Um, but one of the things I like about the TOGAF, you'll see even up the top, they kind of link that business data application and technology as different domains and really try to do that cross-functional breadth and depth across all of those different areas. Um, because when you're looking at a, an organization holistically, you, you can't look at one and not the other. You can't just look at data without the applications and you can't look at the applications without their business value. So it's just kind of a nice framework to look at all of those holistically. Um, when we're looking at data as part of an enterprise architecture, you know, one way to look at this, and this um, is just some of the artifacts you may use, but it's how do we take data and put it in business context or the context of the rest of the organization. So there may be the pure business view you know, what uh, is the business motivation? Why are we doing this? Gosh, I, I think we've all been on projects where sometimes in the middle of it, you come up in the middle of a late night of coding and you're like, why on earth are we doing this anyway? Um, but that's not a crazy question to ask. You always should be asking the why and, and what business uh, value are you supporting? as well as business capabilities, business drivers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, all of these arguably are, are business focused, but business process, uh, especially if you're working in a, a very process centric um, type of industry like manufacturing is a, is a common one that really like uh, has that nice connection with business process and data. Um, the pure data view, as I mentioned with that Zachman framework, there's different layers of data. Yes, physical data models, databases, data architecture is very important, um, but I like to also start with a conceptual data model, just that business view, or you could argue even a business glossary um, is a business view or taxonomy or et cetera, et cetera. So kind of that business view of data, um, and then how do you map them together? So for example, and there's others, how do we map data to process, for example, with something like a good old fashioned CRUD uh, analysis, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so hopefully that's one way to kind of give an overview of sort of how some of these things fit together. Um, I'm, I, I often show some of these kind of, uh, what do you call them, that were trends. Um, and each year uh, I work with data diversity. We do kind of a trends and data management report. The next one should be coming out shortly for this year. So stay tuned. Uh, but this is a question we asked a couple of years back with what types of diagrams do you use in your data slash enterprise architecture? So this doesn't list every enterprise architecture you know, model there could be. Um, and obviously this was a data diversity survey. It sort of trends towards you know, a whole lot of logical and conceptual and physical data models. I did find it interesting that logical and conceptual was higher than physical. I might've thought it was the other way around, but to me, that's a great um, statement that people are really using these for business audiences. I have had great success um, having conceptual data models as part of the conversation when we're working with business sponsors, data owners, you know, kind of that business side. It's just a nice communication tool to really get to the nut of a lot of issues. Um, but you'll see other ones that are pretty popular, you know, right below things like data flow diagrams, you see business process models. I'm not surprised by that. Um, I often do a process model with data. It, it really sort of gets to the how data is used 
Um, and we'll talk more about that. System architecture diagrams, of course, I generally do those as well. Um, if, if you look a little lower, you'll see things like business capability models. We'll cover that today, CRUD matrices, et cetera. So I, I found this heartening um, that a lot of, you know, I'd like to obviously see a lot of these higher as 100%, right? But um, it, it does show that a lot of people are kind of looking holistically at, at data as part of the larger organization. And I, and I think a lot of that is with, with companies trying to be more business driven, uh, data driven, um, which kind of speaks to how do we show data in a, in a business context. So um, moving on, I think we've all heard the analogy or used the analogy of, you know, sort of building architecture. You know, we, we try to, if, if you're a data modeler, say, or a data architect on this call, and people try to explain, you know, what do you do for a living? Well, it's kind of like when you have the architecture for a house and you try to say how many rooms it has and where the bathroom goes, um, you know, that's what we're sort of doing with the data. And it's a very nice analogy. Um, and, and, and I think if I'll refer to this later, we actually did a webinar with a construction company that was using both kinds of models, both data models and design models. So that was sort of nice. But I think when we're in the world of building up, you know, a skyscraper, it's pretty clear that there's a difference between designing the skyscraper and building it, you know, one is very tactical with a hammer and nail. Well, it's not hammer and nails for a skyscraper, but <laughs> permit me the analogy. Um, yeah, the, well, actually building it and getting your hands dirty versus designing it, which is more of you know, before we build, we really need to understand is this a hundred uh, story skyscraper or a five story skyscraper? There's going to be a huge difference in terms of the materials you use, how long it takes, et cetera, et cetera. We're pretty um, used to that in a, in a you know a physical building and we don't question that so much um, and I think again because it's so tactile there's also a clear distinction in some of these roles and of, co of course in a smaller project maybe one of these people can do all of the above you know I did a small addition on my house um, and the person who did it sort of did some simple diagrams and quote, engineered it and also did the building. But that, that was a very small, you know, kitchen. <laughs> I, that, I wasn't building a skyscraper. But if you are building a larger enterprise type building, um, you know, you, you've got the architect. You can, if you're on a building site, you can probably tell who the architect is. He's wearing a suit, right? <laughs> he's got the hard hat, but he's got the diagrams under his arm. Um, and that person is, you know, working with the, the owner. They're drawing the diagrams. They're looking at the vision. You can see them almost moving their hands around saying, what if we had another floor? And what if we had windows looking out towards the mountains or whatever it was, right? Um, you kind of expect that. I think there's a lot of parallels with the data architect. I almost, you know, how do you shut up a data architect, tie their hands together, right? We're always the ones, Let me, give me a whiteboard. How can I draw this out, right? Um, engineer, similarly, I think we understand that that's the person that's gonna make sure that that skyscraper doesn't fall down. Are we using the right materials? Um, you know, where do I, what kind of steel do I use, et cetera? And then the builder is the, the person on the site, you know, swinging the proverbial hammer um, to actually do the building of the house. And there's a lot of skills within that. Are we pouring the concrete? Are we doing the, you know, you know, the glass work or whatever? Um, but again, because it's so tactile, I think you clearly see those distinctions, um, especially on a bigger project, obviously, sometimes in a smaller project, you're one person. But similarly with, uh, with tech, or, or data, um, it is often difficult to tell folks apart. You know, here we have our, our, our hipster developer. Um, they all look the same, right? <laughs> We're in the same clothes. You're still in front of a computer. Um, how could just the average person understand? But I do think there are those that, the distinctions. I think with anything, we have trends, and I know these these roles. Um, sometimes it's kind of what do we call this role of the person we're going to hire we actually did do a webinar last year on that in terms of roles if that's something you are trying to hire for or kind of do your own job description you might want to catch that one um but there are still those types of roles um an architect still should work with quote the business owner to understand the needs draw the diagram see their vision and requirements um look at that vision kind of get excited about the owner's vision for your business project engineer, I want to make sure the data platform is structurally, um, you know, sound. Should it be on the cloud? Um, what are our data pipelines look like? Is it performant? A lot of work there, but it's different work than the architecture work. And then the builder, I might be actually writing the code. Um, and again, there is overlap, but I think separating out those types of activities um, so that you don't just jump to build, I guess is what I'm saying. And architecture isn't just documentation after the fact, it needs to be done before the fact. You don't you don't build the skyscraper and then say, huh, maybe we should tell somebody how many you know, floors there were. And if it's not gonna fall down, it's, it's sort of too late. Um, so I, I, th I think these parallels exist, but sometimes it's a little less clear in, in terms of some of the role, but there, there should be kind of these distinctions. 
Um, when I look at a, a good data architect, just like probably a good architect for a house, um, you may wonder about this one, uh, one of Don, Donna's weird, <laughs> weird thoughts. Um, but if you're familiar with, with Janus, who is the god of the, the word January, comes from that, um, he was the two-headed god at the beginning of the year that can both look forward towards the new year and also look back to the past year's um, in history. Um, I kind of think a good data architect can sort of be that multi-headed approach in terms of the business and technology. So a good architect can say, okay, this is where the business needs to go. We really need to do more real-time data streaming so our customer support can do, you know, faster response. Uh, so what kind of technology we need for that? Um, and, and vice versa, we have this technology, what's the business need we could use for this, et cetera. So it is sort of a, a rare breed of a person that can look both, but that's a, also a very valuable part of the organization and that's why some of these tools will go through are kind of focused on both you know we, we are kind of trying to sum up the business but it's that technology view you know i'm, I'm working with the quote owner am i building a, a summer cottage or am i building a you know a mansion uh, and why and so that that's sort of the same thing from a data point. um so what are these architecture diagrams and artifacts so just some tools of the trade and maybe some thoughts of, of how to use them um, so one we use a lot, and you've probably seen it in my presentations, I'm a big fan of what I call the one pagers. Um, you know, I think Shannon actually, <laughs> I, I say this one a lot, kind of your elevator pitch. How do you sum up anything in your life in that quick one page, uh, five minute summary? And I do this in my own life. You know, what's the so what? There's so much complexity. The more, I, one of my customers said, and I stole this from her, you know, when in doubt, zoom out. The more complex things get, how do you zoom out and see the big picture, get up into the, you know, the, the airplane so you can look down at the fields and really see where you're going. Um, and so all of these artifacts that I'll be showing, a lot of them have that flavor of them of, if, because we are, we are in a world where things have to move quickly. So you probably can't get away with doing a process model that's as, as a first phase that's going to take you six months or a year, right? It's what's just enough of these models that we can get that big picture, see the interrelationships and then keep moving. So this is one we build that is called a business motivation model, which really sort of sums up of the so what, of what are we even trying to do as an organization? Obviously, this is a fictional art company, um, art supplies, but what are we trying to do? What's our mission and what's our vision? And then what are some of the internal drivers as a company uh, that may be in your corporate report? You know, we're trying to get that 360 view of customer. We're trying to grow revenue. This could be, I don't know, it could be an insurance company. We're trying to reduce risk. You know, getting that summary of what the organization is trying to do and then also looking externally. So for example, this is a fictitious art supply company. They could have said, you know, we only do brick and mortar. We really love our craft people to come into the store and we have sewing circles and we do all of that. Had they only done that, um, they didn't look at things like the external drivers of digital self-service and COVID hit, they probably still wouldn't be in business, right? So how can they take their model and look at what's happening externally? And really, you, you want to do that with your own company. Um, and then what are the goals and objectives from a data lens? Uh, so if, for example, instead of going to management and saying, hey, we need to build a data governance framework, which can seem kind of dry and boring, what are kind of these marketing <laughs> headlines of, well, we need better accountability for our data. We need better data quality. We need to build a data culture to really use data to drive business decisions or something like that. But again, this looks really simple, but sometimes the, and they shouldn't take a long time. It should be a day or so to build them or a, a workshop. But we do a lot of these in whiteboarding, um, but it really, sh they're often very hard to do to sum up things that are very complex and kind of those one liners. Um, okay, another one is sort of a use case model. There's often a lot of things you could do, um, but how do we break that up? Especially, um, this was sort of an anonymized one of a you know, multinational company we did, and everybody had their different ways of doing things. Um, so, you know, maybe for customer experience, what are those things that we would need to do around customer experience versus customer insight or reporting? And then in these different areas around the globe, you know, maybe there's a heat map of um, what are the areas that the most people are using and going to have the most value. You may not need something as complex in your organization, but these kind of heat maps I often do um, if we're doing, say, a 
you know, targeted data strategy. We do a lot of interviews. Sometimes I'll do something like this and just, you know, the people you talk to, you know, every single person we talked to said they need better analytics around customer. You know, only three people said they need better network analytics. So maybe we pick the customer analytics because it aligns with it. It aligns with everything else. You know, isn't always you pick the one that's most popular. There could be some, you know, BAU things you need to do. Um, but it is a nice, I, again, I'm a visual kind of person. I think a lot of people are. So kind of showing these in a heat map is a sort of a nice way to look at things. Um, business capability models, I find myself doing a lot more of these. I like these for several ways, uh, reasons. Uh, one is it abstracts the what, what the organization does, um, but as, aside from an org chart. Um, and so th these can, it can be a little tricky sometimes that definition and, and you can look at, you know, yes, maybe marketing is a department as well, but organizations change, but the core capabilities of needing to market things remains and and that's why the, the the excuse me the benefit of looking at the capability perspective and not the org chart perspective even though there's obviously excuse me some overlap this is also helpful when say you are trying to go digital we still need the capability of marketing um, but we're now going all digital how does marketing change and what what capabilities may need to change or how do we do those capabilities in a different way um, so i i find these kind of things very fascinating and, and you're really trying to get the nut of the organization. Uh, we do this for our own company, um, kind of what's the nut of what we do. Uh, but I think what's interesting from the data lens and um, another kind of a heat map type approach is to uh, sort of build an overlay. So if you have your high level data domains, customer product, account, location, et cetera, et cetera, you know, what, what data overlay would be um, so product would obviously be in product development and marketing and sales, uh, legal, et cetera. So you can kind of do that heat map of, you know, our, say we're trying to prioritize master data domains or something or, or do impact analysis to when we're making a change to something like master data. This is a nice way to really kind of see that and see that cross-functional data usage. Another way I use... Um, with these organizational capabilities and also org charts, um, I think that is a, a helpful lens to look at, is when there's a little tangential to um, enterprise architecture, but I had to put it in there because I think it is a very helpful use case for an enterprise architecture, is when you're building data governance and, and the or any, any data organization, uh, it isn't just data governance, it could be your analytics team or your data team, or you know, there's, there's so many different ways teams organize themselves now uh, with more kind of business centric teams, um, but it's important to look at the organization capabilities and uh, org structure. And uh, is it a federated model? Um, is it a top down hierarchical model? You know, the one, the picture on the right is a very common one that sort of, um, you know, is more of a hierarchical, almost kind of a DEMA, DM Bach approach. That doesn't work for everybody. Some people want more of a federated approach. So, you, and also what, what, capabilities do you want in your committee? You don't just want, you know, I know Joe and Mary, so they're going to be in the steering committee. You need to look, are we having a cross-functional approach from marketing to uh, finance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think it's a helpful way to also design your governance organization or your data organization overall. Um, wanted to kind of sprinkle in some use cases here of how we use these. I think if, if you join my webinars, one of the things I try to offer um, is some real world concrete uh, lessons learned generally on the positive. Sometimes I admit some things we've done wrong just so you don't have to do them. Um, I just, you know, if you hadn't picked up on that, I, I do this for a living around a small um, consulting company uh, that does this. So the more I think I can also show you that these things are used in the real world, it's not academic. Um, hopefully is helpful to you. So this one we used, um, we were lucky enough to support a big merger of two massive insurance companies, uh, two global insurance companies. And you can just imagine insurance is extremely data centric. So you can see the quote from the CEO there um, of one of the reasons they did the merger was not only the book of business, but the book of data really right, was. So all of the informa combined information assets of those companies, they realized was the strategic advantage. And another challenge is you, you're, you know, what's that saying? Moving, changing the wings on a moving plane, but even more so, you're putting two planes into one. Um, and how do you do that? So one of the ways to abstract that, and, and you can imagine the politics of, 
if you had looked just at an org chart. So what we tried to do is look at the different business capabilities of company A and company B. So both companies do underwriting, both do whatever. One company has uh, this and not this. So we started from that business capability and then we sort of did that overlay of the common data foundation. Um, and it was a really helpful way to sort of A, prioritize, you know, certain things like underwriting had to be done first. Um, how do we merge? How do we get that data in a, in a way that can be used across the organization? And it was a really helpful way to speak to the organization that, that again, I'm sure you get this a lot too. The business knows we need data or we need, you know, better technology, but how we do it or what it is exactly, that that's that's why they hire the, <laughs> the techie people. So th this can be a really helpful way to communicate some of that and help with the prioritization. So this was a really, I think, great example of literally using a business capability model with a data overlay to really drive a successful merger and acquisition of two major corporations. So um, data models, you knew I couldn't go too long without talking about data models. They're near and dear to my heart, partly because they're so darn helpful. Um, but when you are looking at a data model, remember the different layers. So I would think in an enterprise architecture, you are sort of at those top three levels, the, the up at up the sky of a conceptual, uh, the business sense of an enterprise architecture, right? The, if we're looking to align with the business, you're up at the conceptual and logical. And then of course the physical is when you're getting down to the implementation layer. Um, but if we're looking for the business alignment, you wanna kind of stay in those blue areas or that dark green, if you really want a high level subject area view. Um, you know, a conceptual data model, I find, uh, we use them all the time. I almost can't start a project without them. They can be done very quickly. I think, you know, we've had some great experience of, you know, do a, a whiteboarding session, you know, now even online, you can do mirror boards and things like that. And I find you get to sort of 80 to 90% of the conceptual model pretty quickly, even with people who've never seen one before, because it's the business. People can understand I've got products and employees and customers and patients and students and all of that. And then you also pretty quickly get to that extra 10 to 20% that may take you another six months. That is the problems of the business that, yeah, you're right. We can't really align our sales reps with the sales they made across regions. Everything else is easy. Let's get to the easy stuff, but these are the, and then you'll get to the arguments of, of how we fix that. Um, so I think they can really get to you know, highlighting the core, so what, of things we need to do pretty quickly. Um, th this particular tool that's being used, I like because it shows the definitions. This is to me almost a combination of a business glossary and a conceptual data model, but you, you can really get, again, just the crux of some issues just by reading it here. An employee is a full or part-time worker on the active payroll for the organization. Contractors are employees. Um, and someone would say, well, yeah, contractors, right. They're not, they're 1099s, they're not employees, but part-time, no, they're not employees either. We only consider a full-time or whatever, but you can see right there, you can start some healthy discussions and it gets, again, just the number of times we think we're talking about the same thing, you know, that classic, what is a customer? We all have a different definition. Uh, this kind of gets to the nut of that so you can do everything else. I do find it also helpful to get down to the logical level. And sometimes it really depends on the use case, the business, customer, et cetera, of how conceptual uh, or almost subject area of you. I think there's helpful to have that one page of the core concept of an organization, but sometimes you really can't get to that story without going a little deeper. Um, I'll refer back again to the, the case study we did in March um, at a construction company. And, and because they were such a complex company, we really had to get down in order to, order to make sense to the logical level to really get to some of those so what's. Um, here at the bottom, we're talking about a part. Is it a raw material, a finished good, a sub-assembly? You know, it's it just saying we have parts and products maybe is too simplistic to get to some of the answers. So again, that really depends on the use case and how you're using it. Um, I mentioned that case study. I won't go into super detail because you can catch the replay because uh, the university keeps them all in line. But um, I think this case study we did in March from a big construction company, Kiwit, um, shows a couple of things. It shows, uh, well, hey, I just love the story because it literally is that we, we use, you know, we always use that analogy of a building architecture <laughs> with data architecture. And that literally is what they do for a living. They build buildings and do uh, architecture. Um, so showing how they used both the kind of high level subject area model as well as the conceptual model. And they also sort of aligned to their business capabilities at a very, almost a conceptual business capability. Why and, and how we did that is this is a company of doers. They build things. Um, 
And so everything they did from data, it related to what are the stuff we're doing, we're designing, we're building, we're you know commissioning or constructing. And so it was hard to think of data not in those that context. So that was an example of using data of how the business works, which was by a business capability. So you might want to catch that. It was really helpful. Um, process is another way. And, and again, in that construction company, it could have been a process model as well. I often see manufacturing is a nice a use case for using things like process models because it's so embedded in say the development cycle of we do X, we do Y, we do Z, and then what data is used in each one of these. So you'll see kind of a you know fictitious one on the right um, where this was you know the product has been developed, it goes to supply chain and then it goes to marketing. And here in this case we should have showed that you know the product name is given a code name and development. It's given a temporary price by supply chain based on the costing, but then it doesn't actually get its final name and price until it goes through market testing and, and product naming, et cetera. Um, and so you, again, I'm a big fan of pictures and things. You can literally see the people on the swim lanes of the groups, the little database icon, the fact that an email was sent. This is sort of a stylized BPMN notation if people are familiar with that. Um, but it really, actually this was sort of an anonymized a thing we did from a customer where that actually was the prob problem uh, that the getting that right name consistent and then the price consistent across different areas was really important. This can also be a nice helpful way to start to develop your data governance. So I would think those swim lanes uh, could be your data owners or your data stewards or the people on your data governance committee because they all have a best special when you sort of say, and I could do a whole webinar on this one, but who owns product? You know, it's so easy to say, okay, when we have the product group that owns product. Well, not really, because supply chain has a, you know, a voice on product and marketing has a voice on product. And so that's where these cross-functional groups are important. And that's where sometimes these, these process flows with the swim lanes can really help with that. Um, customer journey map is, to me, it's kind of like the, the newer hipster version of a process model. Uh, it, it's kind of like a process, but it, it's just from the customer's point of view and really getting that customer's journey. I'm, I'm talking about a customer journey map um, because that's sort of what's often used. We've successfully done student journey maps. Um, we had a good success story at a big uh, university here in the US that really had a lot of value by just trying to track that student journey from when they applied to when they graduated and, and when they became an alum um, and what data was used to support them. Um, you could do a patient journey, you could do et cetera, et cetera. Um, but customer journey map is kind of like the classic one you see. And this could be from, again, when they're discovering the product and they're browsing the web to when they're kind of looking more detail and consideration, maybe they visit the store or request literature online to purchase and then support, it could be loyalty program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, this is kind of a stylized version of it, but you can even see along the bottom what data would be used each pieces of these. So you won't, no surprise, one of them is customer. But when, what attributes of customer? Do you have the same email across all of these? Do you have the same address? Or did they give the wrong email when they're talking to the salesperson, but then when they want the product delivered, they want their right email? And how do you overwrite that, right? Um, so these are a helpful way to kind of step back a little and see, A, from the user's perspective, how you're supporting the user. Um, it also has sort of that swim lane diagram approach with, you know, sales, marketing, supply chain, who, who is involved in this journey. And then you can do those overlays in different ways you can do it um, in terms of what data is used to each step of the journey and how do we keep that consistent. So, again, a lot of these you'll see are, are, are fairly intuitive. Uh, if you're not technical, you can still understand this. And I also have a lot of experience with kind of workshops and whiteboarding. And again, a lot of these can be done initially with sticky notes or virtual sticky notes. Um, and, and you can get to finalize a customer journey map. I'm, I'm not belittling that effort for any of these. Uh, business process can be, you know, really months to really get that down all of the detail, but starting at that high level can really get to a, a lot of value quickly. Um, good old fashioned CRUD matrix, uh, I think one of the most helpful tools with one of the worst names, I mean, we call it Druck or something else. Uh, but anyway, um, the, the CRUD comes from the, the letters C-R-U-D for created, read, updated, or deleted. Um, but this is a nice way to think of master data management. This is a really helpful thing there of, we have something like product price. To go back to that previous example, okay, it's, it's, 
it's uh, created in supply chain accounting when they're kind of pricing out the product, but then marketing is going to update that when they kind of look at what other customer or other competitors are pricing their product. And then finance is going to use that for their things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we've actually solved a lot of problems by, oops, we didn't realize there was a U there. So we didn't know that we created it here and someone else is updating it. No wonder things aren't aligned or they're updating it in a different way or or they're updating it in two systems that don't talk to each other, you know, all of the combinations of this. Or I didn't know someone else was reading this. Oh, how do they use it? They're using it in a completely different way that we didn't realize. So again, that kind of ties in with, with governance and quality and all those other things as well. Um, uh, again, a lot of these tools, and that's why using some of these frameworks that I talked about earlier, the TOGAF or the um, Zuckerman framework, et cetera, it, it does kind of show that all of these fit together in a nice you know, matrix in a way. The, the value of these diagrams isn't always just in them individually, but kind of connecting them. So I think, for example, a business process model um, and a credit matrix can really go nicely together where you can see on the left, they have kind of the, the swim lanes and the, you know, received an order, I filled the order and I shipped it. Um, so across those different activities, receiving and filling it and shipping it, um, what data is created, read, updated, deleted, et cetera. And, and again, even at that high level, it can be really valuable as you're trying to get to some of the, the key issues in your organization, especially master data. I use these a lot for that. Um, another little uh, case study here. Um, which I've used before in these webinars, but it, it does because it, it just has a lot of nice tie-ins to this. So this was a restaurant chain in the US um, and they had a problem with their data. I think we were brought in initially from marketing, um, but they knew that they they, they were very innovative marketing uh, restaurant chain. They changed their menu a lot. That was kind of their differentiator. Um, and so to do that and to price that accordingly and to really understand the market trends, you, you know, their product, it was, you know, it's product and customer, their product really was the menu and all the areas of that menu and the components of that product were the, you know, the ingredients and et cetera. And they had just like a product development team, a product you know, chef kitchen that kind of really experimented with new menu items and things like that. But they didn't have, I think one of the marketing folks said, you know, I think our menu printer has a better history of our products than we do. They didn't really look at it that way. Um, and so, they had had a problem with pricing some of their products. They, long story short, I think there was a, a menu item you could add a fancy slice of cheese on top, but you know on, on the on a point of sale system. But they didn't price it accordingly, um, and they they lost a great deal of money that year because what was on the point of sale system didn't match what was should be priced on the menu based on the supply chain procurement, et cetera. So how we sort of got, it seems like an easy solution, but nobody really could see that whole issue. Uh, so what we started with, we talked to all the different groups and we did actually draw out a process model and some credit matrices to actually show across the life cycle from when even the issues, it was fascinating actually, when the chef decides I'm gonna make this menu item, it has to have farm fresh eggs from Canada, it has to, you know, or whatever. Um, then that same supply chain uh, item has to be on the menu, has to be priced accordingly. And so as a result of that, we realized that master data management was really what was needed and then the associated governance around that. But their governance was really tied into product launch. So at their company, anyone can stop a launch if no matter what. So, you know, we're launching this too close to a holiday or the colors in the menu don't match the colors on the, you know, again, I found it really interesting, um, you know, the colors of the store or whatever. And, and so we basically gave the data team a first order saying we can't launch because the data isn't right. You know, the, the, the product number doesn't align or the pricing on the menu doesn't align. And that really, it sort of integrated governance with their business as usual. Um, so it was really a master data issue, but we wouldn't have seen that had we not done the process model and the capability models and, and all of that. So um, kind of a nice little success story about really it was a data issue, but we wouldn't have seen it without the full enterprise architecture. Okay, so we've talked a lot about kind of the bigger picture things, um, you know, process and capabilities and customer journeys and things like that. I don't want to forget that there is actually, I mean, enterprise architecture doesn't only mean uh, the business side, um, and you do at some point have to get down to the data and technologies and platforms. Um, I wanted to kind of bring in some of these trends again from that report we do each year, um, that despite the fact that there are so many options um, in the market today, 
relational databases, um, in this case, 75% were still on-prem, um, are still kind of the workhorse that drive the business. So nothing wrong, I will be the first to say, relational databases are great at what they do, they're not going away. Um, I know a lot of the vendors who do other technologies say, you don't need relational databases, now we have you know graph. You need both, they is fit for purpose solutions. So I found that interesting, what keeps me up at night in, in fits of depression is the next one of 71% are still using spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are great, I use them every day, but not as a data platform. Um, so again, fit for purpose solutions. Um, but we'll show that what's also shown is there's also a lot of other great choices that can be used to augment those. Um, so the, I'll, I'll show you kind of an as is and to be. And so in terms of these technology trends, if you look at what people are using today in the report, uh, still relational on-prem databases was the by far, you can see the graph up top, the, the winner. Um, but you'll also see that the, the spread of other things, even things like legacy mainframe and cold brawl, which are still being used. So we, I mean, I wouldn't say anyone should start a brand new initiative with a mainframe. You can't really knock them, they're still working, right? So, um, but um, you'll, you'll see that again, relational databases on-prem, uh, cloud is definitely something that's growing, but you'll see that there's a lot of other options out there. Graph databases, NoSQL, IoT streaming, um, you know, big data, media, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that's what makes something like an enterprise architecture even more important. So when we looked at future trends, you'll see that you know more folks are going to a cloud-based relational database and that, that fits with my experience um, and a lot of great reasons to do that. Um, but you'll also see, and maybe it doesn't come across unless you look at them quickly together, all of those other lines also get bigger. Um, and so even though it's, it's a both and, not either or. And so yes, uh, there'll be a lot of both relational and on-prem databases, and also things like big data platforms, graph, NoSQL, uh, a lot of other options to consider. And so as you are looking at your overall architecture, I would, if you are only looking at relational um, databases um, to maybe augment with some of these other it's not necessarily replace this you know, i wouldn't want to necessarily put my accounting system on and some you know <laughs> it's real-time data streaming but um yeah i think there's a lot more choices which can make things a lot more complex but also more exciting um and then how you draw that out and so i'm going to continue my sort of mantra of keeping it simple uh you know i think a lot just having um a high level system architecture of how these things fit together. So the one in the lower right is sort of a simplified version of, yes, we have an exploratory data lake, um, which is both a sandbox and operational. We have our enterprise systems of record, master data, reference data warehouse, both are valuable. They both can work together. You need pr privacy across both. You know, Having that zoom out big picture can be really helpful. I'm also a big fan of, I call it kind of the car cartoony version of an enterprise architecture diagram. I often, or a system architecture diagram, I often see these are missing when we go into companies, partly because people just always don't have the time or the permission or the inclination to step back and do that big picture. We have a deadline. We have a you know product I need to deliver. I'm, exact, for an example, in the one behind, where I'm doing the marketing cloud work, I, I, I'm not really responsible for looking at the big picture. But telling that big picture and using some icons, and again, is often where we'll you know, see some value, a little person where there's a manual effort, a little cloud works on the cloud. Uh, put, uh, you know, we could say that often I have this and it's riddled with spreadsheets and we can say, gosh, we really don't want these spreadsheets, we're gonna move these to a system. Or you have 16 different, or not 16, you have three different uh, BI tools and they'll all be using the same way. Do you wanna to rationalize to one tool or, or something like that? But it's a nice visual way to kind of see things. And, and we found amazing things just again, when in doubt, zoom out. And again, not to name names, because we all, you know, whatever, but we've seen things like a company that had three different customer master data management systems. If you know what master data management is, that single version of the truth, you see the, the irony in that, um, or a master data management system that isn't connected to the right things, um, you know, cloud systems that don't integrate correctly with, you know, aren't sourcing from the right source, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it could be something like this in a diagram, there's just a line missing and you're like, aha, that's, that's, that's why it isn't working. We don't have a connection between system A and B. Um, so again, they can be really helpful to kind of tell that. Um, okay, so I, I probably ran a mile a minute as I tend to do, but um, we did want to leave some time for questions. So in, in summary, hopefully 
I know a lot of folks who joined this call have a lot of experience and which is kind of fun with the Q&A, um, but hopefully there was something that maybe is a different way of looking at it that can, might add another tool to your toolbox, or it might just be validation of what you're doing now and you're not crazy, other people do this too. Um, um, but again, a lot of different ways to show it. My bias is let, let's do it with this going to show the highest value um, and get to the, the end result as quickly as we can. Um, Again, a little bit of a plug before Shannon opens it up for questions. Next month, we will talk about metadata management near and dear to my heart and, and definitely growing in the industry. Um, uh, and again, all of these will be on demand if you can't catch them. And uh, blatant plug, we do this for a living if you need help. And <laughs> now I will open it up for questions. Shannon? Donna, thank you so much. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Uh, so diving in here, uh, Donna, uh, the first question is, uh, you know, why are all the pictures of men? Why are all the pictures of men? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think the pictures were of men. <laughs> Because I found them attractive. I don't know. There's a lady there. There is. Yeah. There's a lady. So people need to pay more attention. Um, <laughs> actually, my uh, partner accuses me. He's like, there's one man I use a lot. He's like, he's in all your pictures. I'm wondering why you keep choosing him. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> he's kind on the eye. All right, next question. Uh, so uh, on to business here. So uh, one thing that mystifies me is why business glossaries are currently popular, but only the rare, very rarely are technical glossaries even mentioned. Um, I don't know if that's true. I mean, I, I think business glossaries are popular because uh, the business needs to understand the data. I think a technical gloss, I guess I would say a technical glossary is the data dictionary, but I guess the, the questioner could be saying like, what do we even mean by IOT or kind of those terms? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think data literacy is becoming more important. In fact, when we, we send out the new uh, trends in data architecture, um, that is one of the big topics of, of how, and you gotta get the right balance, right? I think business people need to know what some of these term, technical terms mean, but without overdoing it. Um, so I am, I'm seeing a little bit that way. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure they're less popular. I think may, maybe the business glossary, and I often say the business glossary does come first because that's really getting at the crux of the data we're trying to use and what it means. But hopefully you'll see that change because I've, I've definitely, I, I wouldn't mix them though. I think I often have nixed a technical glossary because it isn't a business glossary and folks are defining technical terms. I, I just think they're different breeds of things, but I still think they're valuable. I like it. So how does one gain knowledge or become an expert on different types of data modeling? Um, also, are there any rules on which type of model is better for a certain type of situation? Um, I've got a couple of books out there in data modeling. Uh, Dataversity has a lot of uh, good training on data modeling. I'm not sure what they meant by types. I think there's, there's kind of the vertical and the horizontal. So there's types of you know conceptual, logical, physical. So kind of that business centric versus um you know technical and I, I i think the use cases for that are almost obvious right then we're trying to get the high level scope uh but the questioner could also mean you know do we need a graph uh model uh versus a more of the traditional relational um and again i guess i would point to resources i think again starting at the conceptual i think the conceptual should transcend the, whether it's say even a, a, a graph or a relational et cetera, because it should just get to that high level business value. And that might help you in, in some of those other, we've used some of those other models, the business use case, the capabilities, um, the, the different use case prioritization to help decide which model or models, you know, it's not all or nothing. So maybe this model needs more of your relational and maybe you want to try a graph on top of that or something. Um, and then in terms of resources, as gosh, lots of stuff out on data is a great one, obviously. Uh, YouTube even has some good ones and, and, and books. There's a lot of good books, old oh, fashioned books on this stuff, but hopefully that helps. But yeah, and I think also inherent in that conversation, it's not an all or nothing. There's a lot of different options right now. And what are some of the challenges? You know, we get this question a lot, Donna. It's, it's and in this webinar and every webinar we do, you know, what are some of the challenges that you 
face with clients top management while trying to understand the data that they have and how do you deal with that and with them um, can you give examples of smart questions to ask in order to understand how the data flows especially if they are not open to divulging internal policies um yeah I've, i i think mo the most of the tools i showed today have been used for communicating with the business i think if you've tried those and they haven't worked, you also have to sort of judge um, the person. Like, for example, a lot of that information, say we started with that business motivation model. Can you do your own sleuthing and do your best guess from the annual report, from the website, from you know your own knowledge, and then bring something to the business that's probably a good assumption? So that classic, it's easier to change something than develop it out of scratch. I mean, I have had some great experience with just brainstorming whiteboarding sessions, but I know from my experience of when I'm busy and someone comes to me with that, it's like, seriously, could, could you just maybe throw something down and I can edit it? Um, so that might be sometimes where you're getting pushback. Not everyone has the time or inclination to do it with you. So it could just be do some best guesses, try, try to get in their head a little bit. Um, and come really educated to the conversations. And then I think a lot of the, most of those tools that I, actually all of those tools I showed, depending on the use case, ha have been used to tell that story to the business. And I guess I would think of all those tools, which one um, from the CEO or whoever you're talking to, are they a process, would they be you know excited by the process? Would they be excited by the customer journey? That's a great one. Um, if it's say a sales organization, are they thinking of it more by business capabilities because they're doing a merger or something? So. That would be my advice of you know don't show them all of them but but what of those would tell the story from the whoever you're telling that story to or it could be finance and you want to put it in terms of money right so yeah, that's how i that's my advice i like it um so for a large organization with multiple projects what are some of the challenges faced when developing an enterprise architecture strategy and any solutions to overcome them Multiple projects. Well, a lot of it is just personality and politics and, and competing uh, and competing priorities. Um, so I think uh, governing data governance or having a great data governance or a government doesn't have to be just data, um, but is a great way to kind of get everyone together. I think drawing some of these high level diagrams and showing those touch points is a great way um, or even some of those use case diagrams. Right. We're all working on this and in, in, or it's, and sometimes just being clear on, I, I don't know the dynamics, but sometimes it's great of, hey, we're all working on this together. That's great. It shows the value that we're all touching customer data or product data, and this is how we can work together. And sometimes it's, don't worry, that's your space. We're not touching that. We're only touching the 10% that's shared, um, et cetera. So I, yeah, I, I, I guess even, or even just drawing out some of these, what are people working on? And that, that use case model I showed, we've done some of those and found out that, you know, three different teams are working on customer sentiment analysis. So why are we all doing the same thing? So sometimes things like that, again, not knowing organization that 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 could be some tools, either, either you know, some of these tools could be helped to either understand where there's overlap, where there could be collaboration or, or where you need to kind of put the walls up if people aren't working together, just say, you do that, we do this and we'll share here, that makes sense. So Donna, before starting data architecture, do we need data governance to get established first? I don't, I think they work together. Um, we have a whole presentation on that. I, I think, I forget which one came, I was asked to come first. I think that, I think a good data architecture can help inform governance. Um, and I think a, an architect that back to that Janice picture is going to be worth their weight in gold of that, that a lot of these business problems, um, often when we do a, a data governance group, we'll have, you know, what, what's that quick win you can do to show the value of governance and show the value of data. And often it's some sort of architecture related to either show a business problem that can be you know shown through the data model or a data flow diagram of showing why things don't work or a data quality initiative. Um, so I think they go in hand in hand. So sometimes it could be an architecture that helps identify the problems that can be solved through governance or it could be the governance committee that kind of helps spearhead architecture to be done. But I think pretty, pretty quickly they need to come together and both be there. Uh, it's sort of depending on the org, which one's gonna get them both to happen but i think it's hard to do either without the other anything else are we good
Or did I lose you? Yep, sorry. No, I'm just, you know, talking to a mute button. Um, <laughs> I'm good at that. Um, who owns the business capability model? Who owns it? The business should own it. Uh, the organization. Um, yeah, I mean, who, who might develop it, I guess, is what I would say. I mean, often there's an enterprise, arch if there's an enterprise architecture team, just generally who I would say would be kind of the owner of it. Like in a bigger organization, there's generally an enterprise architecture team that that deliverable would probably sit there. If you're a data architecture team, you might want to introduce yourself to the enterprise architecture team. I've, I've gone into groups and, and those teams never work together. And once they meet each other, they say, oh my gosh, we're kind of speaking the same language, just with a different accent. Um, and they can find that there's different tools or maybe the enterprise architecture team had a high level data model, but not the detail and the data team can collaborate. Um, but I, I think some of those overlays like doing the capability uh, data overlay on capabilities could be done by the data architecture. Again, working together. A smaller company, it's probably you. <laughs> I'm sure yeah, a lot of companies that don't have the, you know, it's, it's a team. Um, I think it could be used by the data governance group. It could be, you know, the data governance lead could leverage that. So own is kind of a, a funny word, but yeah, I think probably if you had to say who created it, it's probably the EA team if there is one. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, so uh, very uh, broad question here. So what is the most common client problem that you address? Common client problem? Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a common client problem. I, I mean, I think more and more companies are wanting to be data-driven and at a high level, there's buy-in for that. And but then what we do to get there is probably the big question. And, and, and I think where some of these architecture diagrams could come in is either there's high level buy-in. Um, I don't know, someone could say, you know, Donna, you need to, uh, you know, get in shape. And I know I do, but what do I do? You know, I need a personal trainer to kind of tell me what to do together. I, I know I do, but obviously I'm not doing it yet. So management might have the vision, but not know the tactics. Sometimes there's people in the field that know the ta know the pain points and they're feeling the issues, but aren't able to get the voice. Um, that's why sometimes these tools are helpful. I mean, digital transformation is a, a big one. I don't know if that's a problem or an opportunity, but then how do we get, you know, the customer data in a place that people understand. I mean, that's probably the more general one is a lot of data scattered, scattered around. How do we make it usable, consumable, um, and usable, trusted, and good old fashioned trusted data <laughs> never goes away. I love it. So I think we have time for a couple more questions here. So what is your take on how business capabilities can be used to enhance a quote unquote to be agile organization deploying a DevOps methodology? I like going back to a, a capability because it gets to the nut of what we need to do, but it could be done in a different way. So it could be we have, you know, if, if you're thinking DevOps, I mean, that could be more like technical capability. We still need to deploy, but how do we do that differently, right? Or if you're thinking of a, you know, more of a digital transformation, it could be we still need to sell to the customer, but we're doing it in a different way. So I, I like to step, because often with, with anything, or even we start talking Azure, we start talking DevOps, or we start talking anything, people get right into the tool they want to use or their favorite way of doing things. And I think just kind of stepping back and thinking of the capabilities we're trying to do can be really helpful. Um, otherwise, you know, people can get really passionate and I've heard arguments over, are we going to use Jira or Azure DevOps or, you know, and, and we kind of lose the, the so what of it. But if you try to think either of the business capabilities you're trying to support as a result of this application um, and or what are the te technical capabilities we need to do, we need to design, we need to test, we need to deploy, we need to iterate. And then how do we do it sometimes can just, that, that's why a lot of these diagrams I like because you didn't see much tech on that or any tool names or any methodology or it's just this is what we need to do <laughs> and then you can discuss the how so it kind of abstracts things a little bit that helps indeed so uh i'm gonna slip in one more question here for you uh, when getting to the stories needs of clients in various departments and companies what do you find is the best way to solicit accurate relevant and full data flows etc etc for example Interviews, meetings, questionnaires, surveys, the process might be known or little known even by the clients. I'm sorry, I didn't catch all that. How do you get the detail of everything, like the surveys and 
Yeah, yeah. So when getting to the stories of clients in various departments and companies, you know, mm -hmm. how do you find the best way to solicit the um, accurate and relevant um, data? Um, I'm just thinking when, especially when the questioner asked about surveys and things like that, there was, there was one example we did at a, a big university out west. And what they did was a student journey map. Um, and what they do, we had a bunch of different work. It was really a, a helpful way. So they had, this could be a customer journey map. It could be a you know, sale from, you know, again, all these phases for them. It was the customer, the student journey of, of when they're applying and when they come on campus and when they do these different things. And we almost, we had sort of, at this point, we were on, on, on site and we had kind of a war room and we talked to the different groups and they all, we kind of, again, did the heat map or sticky note approach. So we had this huge war room wall. We, we did digitize it afterwards, uh, but everyone would come in and say, okay, at, at this phase, and actually the surveys made me think of it. We come on site and we give the student a survey and we see if they're happy. And then the next group came in and said, we come in and we give the, customer, the student a survey to see if they like their dorm. We come in and we give the student a survey to see if they like that and we just kind of get the point. And like they saw that like first two semesters of first year, students were just inundated with surveys and then they forgot them until the fourth year when they graduate. And then a student came in and they said, yeah, that's pretty much how it feels. Because <laughs> then they were able to kind of visualize that all of these different touch points that no one person saw um, we kind of use this journey map to show it could be a process model of where do you fit in, what, what swim lane are you, and then what are what activities. Um, and the one we did at the university, we actually had this was the customer journey up top, and then we had the kind of different university departments at the bottom, and kind of what they did, and then the, the piece in the middle that showed that interaction, and it was just kind of a nice visual way, and in a way that you easily people can see. Okay, there's my box, and this is what I do. And because if you just ask them point blank or whatever, it might be hard. So that, that was just one example that came to mind when you mentioned surveys that, and then everybody had the aha moment because nobody else knew that everybody else was sending 17 surveys. And the result of that did with a good story. They all just kind of, I think they ended up with three surveys at the end because they combined them and shared the data because literally no one saw that everyone else was doing the same thing. So hopefully that helps. I love it. Great example. Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, a lot of great questions coming in, but I'm afraid that is all the time we have slated for today and for this webinar. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email out for this webinar by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording as well. So thanks everybody for being so engaged in everything we do. And Donna, thanks so much for another fantastic presentation. Love it as always. Thank Hope you all have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, Donna. Bye.